Kashmir. So the afternoon session is on the topic, Tibetan Dependent Origination and Buddhist Philosophy in Modern Science. Uh, I would like to introduce you all to the chairperson, Professor Mahesh uh, Dioker. Before I go any further, I would like to give a brief introduction of the chairperson. Professor Dioker is head of the Department of Pali and Satra Savitriable Phule, Savitribai, sorry, Phule Pune University. His fields of specialization include comparative grammars of Pali and Sanskrit, Theraveda Buddhism, contemporary Buddhism, translation and editing. He has published many works in technical terms and technique of the Pali and the Sanskrit grammars. Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Sarnath Varanasi, in 2008. And Mr. Dioker has also published a book on Rottamalastri, edited by late Michael Hahn, Shrikan as Bahulkar, Lata Mahesh Dioker, Mahesh A. Dioker. And the speakers today are Dr. Daniel Stewart here. Uh, Mr. Ajirji, uh, Vengeshe Doji Dandilla, and Dr. Supriya Rai. Now, without, without much ado, I would like to request uh, Mr. Deokar to introduce the speakers and take the stage, please. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. So, uh, first of all, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to the organizers, especially my great friend, and I think that's a great honor which he bestowed on me this morning. So, uh, Geshala, uh, especially, I'm very thankful to him, and it has been a, uh, a great occasion for me to be, in, in, uh, to be here um, in Tibet House. It's the first time I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm especially thankful to him personally for his involvement with the Department of Pali in the uh, Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University, where uh, we are running different programs in languages, uh, Pali and Sanskrit, um, introductory Tibetan, and uh, also courses in uh, engaged Buddhism as well as uh, uh, in Buddhist psychology. And he has been a great help uh, for us in running these courses. So um, I'm really uh, happy to introduce the, the speakers today, um, Daniel Stewart. Um, a very good uh, friend and, uh, of mine, colleague, since many years we know each other. Um, a, st a student of uh, the University of Berkeley where he, he did his PhD um, on a very interesting text. Um, uh, he, he worked on Smruti Pasthana Sutra, uh, a very important uh, text uh, which in a way gets many ideas from Theravada, and, uh, I mean the, the Staviravada school and also uh, the other m traditions of uh, of made it to practice. Uh, he's, um, he's currently working on, um, uh, as a Fulbright uh, Fellow in the Department of Pali in, in Pune um, on the history of Vipassana meditation. He is a practitioner himself and is also uh, having the responsibility or shouldering the responsibility of an assistant professor in the University of South Carolina, USA, uh, as a professor of, uh, in religious studies and his specializations are in in, in Buddhist studies uh, and has a, uh, a great um, knowledge of uh, Pali, Sanskrit, uh, Tibetan, uh, and um, uh, I'm not sure about the Chinese as well, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> and he has been a versatile scholar um, and I, I, we are happy that he, he is here with us. Uh, the second uh, to my right, uh, I mean, is uh, Dr. Supriya Rai and um, uh, with her as well, I have a long um, association um, you know, we, uh, she's now heading the, the Center for uh, uh, Buddhist Studies, the KJ Somaya Center for Buddhist Studies uh, in Somaya with um, a student of management, and then she, she turned to Buddhism and uh, has been very much interested, especially in the Buddhist meditative practices. And now she's shouldering the responsibilities of the center, and uh, she is a practitioner uh, and also a very engaged Buddhist, I must say. Uh, along with her scholarship, and um, she has uh, done excellent work on the meditative manuals 
uh, which she published uh, a few years ago, uh, I think this a couple of years ago, it was two years ago. We, yeah, two years ago, and uh, uh, she is with, uh, with us, and she's also been associated with our department as a faculty, um, visiting faculty coming to teach Buddhism and management. So uh, she's again a versatile uh, scholar, and uh, it will be interesting to hear her ideas uh, on this topic. Uh, Geshe-la, you already know, and I think that, that we really do not need to give an introduction. And for the introduction of uh, uh, Mr. Ajira Vidya, uh, I, I, this is my first opportunity to kind of meet him here. Um, but I really don't know much, so I would request uh, Navangji to say a few words about um, him. Um, and then we can straight away start with the session. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Diokor. Thank you very much, yeah. Uh, with the permission of the chairperson, I would like to give a brief introduction of the speaker, Mr. Ajir Vidya. He joined Indian Administrative Service in 1977. After having worked in the central and state government for 33 years, he took voluntary retirement. Since then, he has been studying Buddhism exclusively. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we can start with uh, uh, the paper of um, Daniel Stewart. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to pay my respect to the Venerable Sangha who's with us today, who are all with us today, and my brothers and sisters here. Thank you to Tibet House for inviting me to present to you today. Um, you'll notice that the, the concept note that I was given, my title is a little bit different than that, so it's worth actually reading the very long title I have written. If you want to sort of understand sort of what I'm really doing in this talk to start with, of course we'll get into it, but it's worth having a look because I'm playing a little game in my title. So, And I'll just start here by saying that today I'm going to talk to you really about one text. Um, a Buddhist Sanskrit text from the third century called the Saddharma Smriti Upasthana Sutra. And as a, story in, uh, as a historian of Buddhism, I'd like to pre present some thoughts on this important <coughs> source really as a way to problematize the categories we've been talking about today, the categories of Theravada and Mahayana. Most of us accept this, but actually when we really do history, we have to sort of deconstruct them a little bit. And the, the great thing about the Saddharma Smriti Upasthana Sutra as a text is it helps us do that. Um, so interestingly, this text sort of is not well known, and one of the reasons is because it's ha it hasn't really been that accessible, even though we have translations of it. But recently, a single Sanskrit manuscript of this voluminous text came to light, and I've been working over the past years to edit it and study its importance for the history of Indian Buddhism. Um, so it was composed roughly, and we know dates in India are quite difficult, particularly at this time period. Roughly, we can say in the third century, but probably for a couple of centuries leading up to the third century, really. Um, and it provides scholars with information about really this very key dynamic moment in the history of Buddhism. It's full of quite idiosyncratic textual material on Buddhist doctrine, ethics, meditation practice, and cosmology. A lot of stuff in this text. It's, it's a real encyclopedia. So it's really an invaluable source for understanding the cultural history of Buddhism at this key moment in middle period India. It's also an authorless text. That is, it's attributed to the Buddha. It's a sutra. But we know historically that most of the material in the text must be from a later date than the Buddha and authored by another person or persons. Here's the historian speaking. And of course, later tradition will come to take such material as actually the word of the Buddha. We want to think about that not as sort of one approach or the other, but we want to take both sides of this seriously. Okay? As a historian and when we read the text on its own terms. Okay? 
So the text participates in a newly emerging culture of textual production that began in the early centuries of the Common Era, or perhaps a bit earlier. And this is when we start seeing the production of new sutras, particularly Mahayana sutras, and the development of Shastric traditions, right? Which we don't have really Shastras until these early centuries of the Common Era, okay? Such texts, because of this sort of new moment of creativity, such texts also serve as receptacles for new and unorthodox ideas and developments. And they can often provide cultural historical information that other kinds of sources do not offer, such as early canonical sources. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> modern scholarship has largely overlooked the Saddharma Smriti Pastana Sutra, despite its importance. But it's now becoming clear that this text had currency throughout the history of Indian Buddhism and influenced non-Indian Buddhist traditions. So, for instance, it was quoted in one of the, in the very earliest sutra compilation that we have extant today, the Sutra Samucaya, which is actually traditionally attributed to Nagarjuna, but most modern scholars today date it to around the 4th century, so probably not from Nagarjuna, but who knows? It's not fixed. But probably 4th century, this is the early sutra compilation, and this sutra was quoted in it, so it was already very important at that time, okay? Also, large portions of it were quoted by the famous Shanti Deva in his 8th century sutra compendium, the Shiksha Samuchaya. Here's a nice image of the Cambridge manuscript of the Shiksha Samuchaya. It was also the source for the Dharma Samuchaya, a collection of popular didactic verses extracted from the Sadharma Smriti Pustana Sutra later, probably around the 10th century, but who knows. This is an image of that manuscript from Nepal, of one version of that manu of, uh, one manuscript of that text from Nepal. We also have evidence that the text was studied at important centers of learning in India until very late in the history of Indian Buddhism. So we know, for instance, that, that well-known scholars such as Abhaya Karagupta studied and taught the text at the famous University of Nalanda, and others such as Subhuti Chandra studied it at Vikramashila. And we know this because the Tibetan translator, um, Tsukram Geltsen, studied in India with those masters, pundits. And the sutra was not just influential in India. Okay? We have Chinese and Tibetan translations of the text <coughs> produced in the 6th and 12th centuries, respectively, and these will become relevant uh, to us more generally, but we're really going to be looking at the Sanskrit version of the text for this talk. Um, you can see here just some nice images. This is an early rock cut edition of the Chinese translation of the text from the seventh century. Um, and here is an old um, manuscript Kagyur version of the text from Gonla. The text also became an important source for practice traditions of the Karmakagyu school of Tibet and it likewise influenced a, a wide range of artistic depictions of Buddhist cosmology in East Asia. So here's the third Karmapa who actually wrote a commentary on the text and um, considered it quite important. And of course, uh, Tsukram Geltsen, who translated the text, was a teacher of the first Karmapa. Um, and here's an, an, an interesting image from East Asia of the karma mirror which is a, a, an idea or a, where you, one can envision one's own karma at certain moments of passage in life. And these, this, is the f the, this text is the first place where this idea appears in Indian history. So the point here is that the Saddharma Smritupasthana Sutra influenced Buddhist traditions across Asia and across history, in India and other parts of Asia. Okay, but today I don't want to sort of get that broad. I want to, I want to focus in on how this text help, helps us to think 
or unthink the categories of Mahayana and Theravada. Um, and here I actually want to suggest that we, you know, in this context, we open up our term Theravada, right, to some of these other terms that we might be familiar with such as the Stavira traditions or Staviravada, because we're not talking really, in this context, we're talking about Sanskrit Buddhism of the Sarvastivada tradition. We're not talking about Theravada explicitly, right, which is the Pali tradition in one Nikaya. We're talking about the Stavira traditions of North India, or in the sort of Yana context, we're talking about Shravakayana traditions or the vehicle of the disciples, otherwise known more pejoratively as the Hinayana, which these days we don't really like to use, but it's still pretty common. So the Saddharma Smriti Bhastana Sutra helps us unthink the categories of Shravakayana and Mahayana because it provides us with a historical context in which these categories have not yet solidified in the way that we see them to have solidified today. So proof of the text's somewhat ambiguous categorization can be seen in the fact that well uh, <coughs> sorry can be seen in the fact that well-known scholars such as the translator of the Tibetan text and uh, later Tibetan catalogers actually disagreed on how to categorize it. Okay, so Tsukum Gyaltsen, for instance, classified it as a Mahayana Sutra. But Situ Panchen later classified it as a Hinayana text, right? So just the very fact that two extremely learned pundits of the Tibetan tradition would have that kind of disagreement shows that the text is, it has an ambiguous status, right? And that's quite telling for us in general to think about our categories. Um, so these differing, differing assessments of the text nicely capture the problem of its historical context and its content in that it's hard to see where exactly it might fit within the categories we've been left with today. So now I'd like to explore a few aspects of the text that allow us to see why such ambiguity is understandable and how the text challenges us to question how we have constructed our categories. So I'd like to begin with the frame story of the sutra in which a number of young monks are challenged by non-Buddhist ascetics to explain what makes the Buddha's teaching unique such that he calls himself omniscient or sarvagya. Unable to answer, the monks make their way to the Buddha and he delivers to them the Saddharma Smriti Pastana Sutra. And here's how he explains the point of the text. He says, monks, I will teach you the Dharma discourse called the presence of awareness of the true dharmas, Saddharma Smritupastana. What, monks, is this Dharma discourse called the presence of awareness of the true dharmas? It is this, one sees Dharma as Dharma, and what is not Dharma as not Dharma. Awareness is permanent, permanently present with respect to that Dharma, and doubt does not arise for him. That ascetic is one who knows action, its fruit, and its ripening in birth and death of all three types of action, physical, vocal, or mental. His vision is not inverted. He is not led astray by another teacher. So key here is the statement that one who understands the teaching of the Saddharma Smritipastana Sutra knows action, its fruit, and its ripening in birth and death of all types of actions. This corresponds interestingly with descriptions of, of the Buddha himself in the text, who is defined as omniscient because of his comprehensive knowledge of action, its fruit, its fruit and its ripening. So you can see here some of the, some of the ways he's described. Samanta chakshu sarva pratyaksha karma pala vipaka gya. That's the Buddha, right? one with all-pervading vision, to whom all is evident, who knows the ripening of the fruit of action. And we have other similar epithets. Um, what is more, the Buddha goes on to s explain that his yoga chara disciple, the yoga practitioner disciple, the main actor of the text, is particularly skilled in that very same comprehensive knowledge. 
So in the very first chapter of the text, the Buddha says this. He says, I do not see anyone else who perceives the ripening of the fruit of actions in the way that my yoga chara disciple does, my yoga practitioner disciple does. So this passage is key because while the text presents us largely with categories familiar to the early Stavira tradition, and there's no explicit mention of the Mahayana, it appears here that the teaching is oriented towards pr practitioner disciples interested in working towards attainments traditionally seen as only accessible to the Buddha. So should we then read this as a Mahayana text? A text that teaches one how to become a Buddha? Perhaps another passage from the text will let us think through this a little differently. It allows us to generally problematize the Mahayana label. So this passage here reads like this. According to the degree of effort one experiences towards awakening practice, whether inferior, middling, or extreme, he becomes that extent. If he transforms parinamayati, effort towards the awakening of a disciple, he becomes an arhat and fully immolates. If he transforms effort towards middling awakening, he becomes a solitary Buddha, Pratika Buddha. If he transforms effort towards unexcelled self-awakening, he becomes a self-awakened Buddha. So here we see a tradition that clearly sees all three paths, that of the disciple, the solitary Buddha, and the fully awakened teaching Buddha, as legitimate path possibilities. And I should be clear here that this is also the case in other Stavira traditions. So can it then be categorized as a Mahayana text when we have this? I'd also point out here the use of the term parinamayati in this passage referring to the way a Buddhist practitioner transforms his karmic work towards specific soteriological goals. I point to it particularly because it reminds us of a key passage in Nagarjuna's famous Ratnavali, in which Nagarjuna attempts to both relate and distinguish the path of the, the disciples and the Mahayana path. So what does he say in this famous passage? He says, the vow of the bodhisattva and the transformation of acts, charya parinamana, are not taught in the vehicle of the disciples. How then might one become a bodhisattva from that vehicle? But the statement in the Saddharma Smriti Upasthana Sutra disagrees with Nagarjuna in this respect in that it claims that the transformation of acts is something common to all three vehicles. This difference shows that the kinds of lines that famous early Mahayanists, such as Nagarjuna, wanted to draw were not taken for granted across traditions. There was a debate about this. The categories we now take for granted were in development, in a dialogical and contested process. Oh, is that the end? No, sir. How much time? Three and a half minutes. But surely we might instead draw a philosophical rather than a soteriological line between such traditions. Might this allow us to feel more certain about our accepted categories? In this connection, it is again instructive to appeal to Nagarjuna. In this is instance, I'd like to point to his classical definition of Pratita Samutpada in his famous Mula Madhyamaka Karika. This key quote has become the locus classicus for defining the Mahayana and its key philosophy of emptiness. So I translate the passage as follows. We declare that dependent origination is emptiness. It is a dependent concept, and it itself is the middle path. So there have been a lot of debates about how to translate this passage, but I, I think actually this is a pretty reasonable one. You can disagree with me if you want. Um, but I think the, in the end, the main point is that the teaching of emptiness is here defined as a quality of anything, um, sorry, I think it becomes clear that the core teaching of the Buddha 
becomes the teaching of emptiness, defined as a quality of anything that exists in a dependence relationship of causal conditions. And dependence relationships are concepts, pragyapti, designations, that are ultimately not stable or reliable in any way. With this key classical Mahayana's definition of Pratitya Samutpada in mind, I'd like now to look at a passage in the Sadharma Smriti Pastana Sutra also dealing with the doctrine of Pratitya Samutpada. This passage comes from a section in the Sadharma Smriti Pastana Sutra in which Chakra, or Indra, is giving a Dharma discourse to the deities of the Triastrimsha heaven. So actually, we have here a, a meditation practitioner envisioning Chakra giving a Dharma talk to the deities of the Trias Trimsha heaven. Um, and he also gives a wide range of teachings on different dharmas, their svabhava, etc. But he comes to teach about the Pratita Samutpada, and interestingly, in this very different context than Nargarjuna, he ends up coming to sort of a, a similar philosophical position. So I'll just read the translation here. This is quite a long quote. Hopefully I can still get through my time. And this is actually un uh, has not been published yet. It's from the unedited manuscript. Uh, it'll be published in an article and coming out pretty soon. So here it is. Shukra says, further deities. Here he's outlining the basic this exists, that exists notion of Pratitya Samutpada. Further deities, because the existence of that, this comes into being. For instance, when there exists the combined semen and blood of a mother and father, and there exists the clinging of a Gandharva, or rebirth entity, with respect to a karma that is certain to produce rebirth and necessarily entails the production of an embryo, then rebirth comes about. In this way, deities, because of the existence of that, this comes into being. Because of the non-existence of what, what does not come into being? For instance, when there's the non-existence of a mother and a father, the non-existence of semen and blood, and the non-existence of a karma that's certain to be experienced, then there does not come into being that which accompanies the clinging to the embryo. In this way also, deities, from the existence of that, this comes into being. From the non-existence of that, this does not come into being. For instance, when the opposite shore exists, this shore comes into being. Okay, and then he goes on further. Because of the non-existence of that, without what, what does not come into being? For example, without the opposite shore, this shore does not come into existence. In this way, deities, because of the existence of that, this comes into being. Thus, a concept or designation, pragyapti, comes into being with the assistance of mutually dependent accompanying conditions. All that is composite emerges as mutually dependent accompanying conditions. What is dependently arisen arises in dependence. That is, karmic constructions, samskara, are dependent on ignorance, avidya. Consciousness is dependent on karmic constructions, vistarena, etc. So there we see the classical formula being brought into this larger idea and the notion of pragyapti being invoked. Very close. So I think this passage can be read as in harmony with Nagarjuna's classic statement from the Mula Majjhima Karika. And if we take this idea seriously, I think we again have to raise the question what the categories of Theravada and Mahayana mean when this is a Stavira tradition and it's sort of doing the same thing with the same traditional categories in a certain direction without invoking Mahayana identity in any way. So is, Ma is Nagarjuna more of a Stavira than he's been taken to be, as some have argued? Is the only thing truly separating the early Stavira and Shravakayana traditions from the Mahayana, the development of the idea that the only truly valid soteriological path is the path of fully awakened Buddhahood? Is that how we want to define things? If so, we have to ask ourselves whether the categories we have worked with for so many centuries are serving us in understanding more deeply the historical realities of the communities that gave birth to them. 
What is more, are they serving us in constructing a Buddhism that offers modern practitioners a way to place themselves somewhere in the broader history of Buddhist thought? I will now not attempt to answer these questions, but I'll leave them with you so that we might all work towards some answers in the future through a collective charya parinamana, a transformation of acts. Thank you. Now I would like to request, um, without spending any time, um, uh, Mr. Ajirji uh, for his uh, talk. Yeah, please. Thank you, Chairman. I am really very happy to be here, but I'm not very sure whether you are really happy <laughs> because Dr. Daniel was to come and he was to speak and unfortunately he fell sick and I got a call from Tibet House that Geshela desires that I should replace him. So I don't think I would be able to replace him because he's a professor who has been skilled in teaching I am really, so far the Buddhism is concerned, a kind of struggling student. So you have to listen to, with patience, the student version of the dependent origination. Well, I think uh, uh, when we are saying dependent origination, I really find the word which is used in Sanskrit, which is pratitya samutpad, and when I ask uh, Raji on telephone, the exact meaning of that, so she said that pratitya means to depend and samutpat means to rise from there. Uh, similarly, when I was trying to find out the meaning of this word in the Tibetan, which says that Tenjing Delver uh, Jungwar, so again, the meaning is really coming. And I think the first day when this was used, either in Sanskrit or in Tibetan, I think the word has not changed. It really continued as they were. But when we come to the English, I have really found that there are almost about 10 to 20 translations of that. So like dependent origination, interdependent origination, interpenetration, uh, uh, interconnectedness, interrelatedness. So just to make it very clear, though there is a difference in the English expression, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm taking they are all synonymous because the reference of this expression is the same. That is the lack of inherent existence. So having said that, I would like to just put some of the essential aspects of the essential aspects of the different origination. Uh, the thing exists because it's a kind of relatedness. Uh, there's a Tibetan word which says that a six inch line exists because there is an eight inch line. And the, an eight inch line exists because there's a 10 inch line. Of course, we can go further in relation to their length and the depth. Similarly, I find that uh, Nagarjuna in the precious garland has said, where there's a long, there has to be short. They don't exist through their own nature. So, there's nothing independent existence. Everything is really related. And how it really happens, I think just to give two or three experiments which have been done. One is, I think if you, you, some of you must have come really across, there's a book which is called The Secret of Water. 
I think it became a very big, maybe about seven or eight years back. This was done in the Japan. So what they have done is that they took the water and they kept on sending a very good vibration. And they put that in the fridge and then when it started melting, the droplets, they took the photographs and they found that they were like the a diamond. Same water they put it and then they started sending a bad vibration telling that you're ugly, you're dirty. The same process was followed and again the photograph was taken and they found that each was like a charcoal because that coming out was dependent on that. Let's take in the case of the tree. Again the experiment was done that a lot of electrodes are put in the tree and here was the scientist who was sitting with his uh, 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 laptop and the man was told that okay you move towards the tree with the X and feel that you're going to cut this tree and when the graph came it was really jerky as if there's a kind of violence coming from the tree and the same man was told that now move without any X very peacefully the graph was very flat. So there is so much of interdependence, though we may not be able to really realize that. I think uh, those who are in Delhi, you must have seen, I think it was about two years back, Dr. Atherhan, who is a great cardiologist, he put that in the uh, social media, the lung in Delhi and the lung in uh, Kangda the same age, same profession, the lung in Kangda, it was pink. In the lung in Delhi, it was black. So one is really affecting the other. So what I'm trying to convey is that there is a kind of mutual dependence and the things arise because of that. From the interlatedness, I think another aspect of a dependent origination is the middle way. I think uh, the earlier speaker has also mentioned to that. Now, uh, when we are talking of the middle way, I think the Buddha himself has said in one of the sutra, realizing the doctrine of dependent arising, the wise don't at all partake of the extreme views. The key word here is partake of the extreme views. Nagarjuna in his Mula also has said that which dependently originates is posted to be empty of independent existence. That being dependently designated, this is the middle way. So when we are saying the dependent origination, why do we say that it's a mid middle way? Because the dependence arising it negates the absolutism. And the origination negates the nihilism, which probably was a kind of belief during the time of the uh, Buddha. Now, having said this uh, 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 two or three aspects, the question is that, how did the dependent arising really arise? What is the basis of that? So, number one, I think it is based on the causes and the condition. Okay? That's why it is said that this is, I think, uh, earlier speaker also has mentioned, but this is Buddha himself was, also has said, this is because that is. This is not because that is not. This comes to be because that comes to be. This ceases to be because that ceases to be. After the Buddha passed away, many schools begin to describe Pratitya Samutpad. In Vishuddhi Magga, Path of Purification of Theravad, Buddha Gosha, I think uh, yesterday the Honorable also had mentioned, 24 kinds of conditions, necessary and sufficient conditions of something to arise. Sarvasti Vadin school, they put it four kinds of conditions and six kinds of uh, causes. That is how 
based on the causes and the condition, the things really arise. Uh, I'm very happy to see Dr. Lokesh ji uh, here, because yesterday also he mentioned, and in fact, I'm reading almost the same line, what has been written by Thiknathan in one of his books, when he talked of the interdependent origination. For a table to exist, we need hood, carpenter, time, skillfulness, and many other causes. And each of these causes needs other causes to be. The hood needs the forest, sunshine, sun, rain, and so on. The carpenter needs parents, breakfast, fresh air, and so on. Each of these things, in turn, has to be brought about by other conditions. If we see uh, this way, we will see that nothing has been left out. Everything in the cosmos is present in that. There is so much of interdependence. Uh, so this is one aspect how the things really arise. From the cause, the effect comes. Nothing, I think we, we in India, we used to read in the book that Boya uh, Babul Am Kahan Se Aay. So I think it's, a, it's like that. There's a correlation between the two. And the second way how the dependent arising really arises is based on the whole in parts. I think this is one of the sutra which says, just as one designates a cart in dependence upon a collection of parts, so we assert a conditional sentient being in dependence upon the aggregates. So this is one way of saying, and in Ratnavali, again, when he talks about the humans, he is saying that if the person is not earth, not water, not fire, not wind, not space, not also consciousness, and not all of them, what is the person out of these? So again, saying that the dependent arising, the second way of looking at it that arises from the parts. Uh, dependent arising refers to the fact that all phenomena exist dependent upon its parts. Everything has part, but these parts can be at the gross level as well as the uh, subtle level. Let's take a pot. The pot has the shape, it's a lid holding, but when we look into that, there could be the dependence on the molecular uh, basis also. So uh, that is uh, one way. That is the second way how the things really arise. And the third way is the dependent origination through imputation. This is the, again the sutra, is called the Utpali uh, Requested Sutra. The various delightful flowers blossom as the sparkling spring golden abode uh, stain and uh, so something for, sorry, for of these is there a creator, they are posted by the power of thought. It is through conceptualization that the world is imputed. So that is the third way. Now, the, when we're talking of the phenomena, I think, there is the permanent phenomena, and then there is the impermanent phenomena. Like the imputation, for instance, I really find is very necessary to have to, uh, 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 to uh, name in respect of the permanent phenomena. And you may be very surprised that there are permanent phenomena. In fact, uh, Abhidharma Samuchaya has listed eight of them. The space, which is the unobstructed space, analytical cessation, non-analytical cessation, and uh, four, five, six, three suchness of the virtuous, non-virtuous, and the neutral phenomena. Meditative absorption without discrimination, meditative absorption with cessation. 
So these are the three ways how the things are arising and they all arise dependently. I think when we are talking of the dependent arising, without mentioning emptiness, I think it would not really be complete because I really feel dependent arising and the emptiness, they are like the two sides of the same coins. No coin can have just one side. If it is one side, nobody will accept. It, is, it becomes non-functional. So similarly, we really have to accept and see that other side of the dependent arising is the emptiness, the empty of inherent existence. So this is what uh, Nagarjuna says. Since there is no phenomena that is not dependently originated, therefore there is no phenomena that is not empty. Well, I think if we see that uh, things are inherently existent, but they exist. It's like saying that it is there, yet not there. So how do we really interact with that? After all, we are part of the phenomenal world, and we have to interact with the phenomenal world. Uh, when Buddha gave the teaching on this aspect, Ananda was present. And Ananda said after the teaching, Venerable Lord, the teaching of different origination appears to be deep and subtle, but I find it quite simple. Then Buddha replied, don't say, don't say that Ananda, the teaching of the different origination is indeed deep and subtle. Anyone who is able to see the nature of different origination is able to see the Buddha. So it's almost like saying that if we don't see the different origination, we don't see the Buddha, which we are all aspiring to see. Uh, even Aryadeva has advised in his 400 stanza, he says that when dependent arising is seen, ignorance does not occur. Thus, through all efforts, just try to find the subject. Okay, I'll conclude. So the question is then, how do we interact? How do we really interact? Again, one of the great sutra which says, just as in the dream of a young girl, she met with a boy and saw his death. Joyous was she at the meeting and the anguish at his death. View all phenomena like this. Well, I think, uh, Another aspect of the dependent origination, if it is not said, it would not be complete. Dependent origination is considered as the king of the reasoning. I think this is accepted by all, all the traditions and there is no doubt on that. And when we are talking uh, in respect or the, in the context of the present uh, modern science, what the science do, they examine they analyze, and what is the tool? It is really the reason. So I think there is a kind of convergence when we're really talking of the modern science and the, uh, uh, the uh, dependent uh, origination. As Geshe La also said yesterday, Geshe Dorji Damdul yesterday, Buddha himself has said that what I say, don't accept based on the respect and the faith. Analyze it like the goldsmith who melts, cuts, rubs, and see the purity of the gold. So I think uh, that is what really the king of the reasoning is almost like saying that if the mirage, if the mirage were to be water, why not the people close by see the water? How does that happen? 
from the distance, animals, the birds, the human beings, we all see that the Miraj is like a water. But we go close and see whether it is really there, we find that it is not really there. That's because of the power of the reasoning, which is an essential aspect of the uh, uh, independent origination. Uh, I'll conclude uh, by saying that when it is the question of the inherent existence, this principle did not exist in the past. It doesn't exist now, and it is not going to exist in the future because this is the law of the nature. And so for the science and the Buddhism is concerned, one of the Nobel laureate who was nominated for the Nobel Prize, he said that physics is the new way of understanding the Buddhism. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Um, now I would like to request uh, Geshe-la, as he was saying, in the morning stage is yours. I'll say the conference is yours, so please. <laughs> <Go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, every one of you. Um, respected venerable monks and venerable nuns, nuns or none. None. Today there is only one. Yesterday there were three. Okay, and then all the the our chief guests yesterday, Dr. Lokesh Chandraji, and um, Professor Aris Bhatji there over there hiding behind the second row. Okay, so it is a great honor for all of us here, respected uh, chairperson, uh, Professor Devgarji, and all the, the, the presenters here. So um, I'm going to give um, a very quick, say the confluence, idea of the confluence of Buddhism and physics. Physics. <clears throat> So the topic of this is to see is ontological reality in quantum physics, and sometimes, of course, the philosophers, particularly the philosophers and also the physicists, they tend to use jargons to make sure that ordinary people, they don't, they see that they are so great. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the, the jargons that they use, ontological reality. So what it, it, what it really means is, what's the objectively there, what's the objective reality, as simple as that. So ontological reality in quantum physics and Buddhist philosophy of ultimate reality. One thing which is common between the two traditions is the inquiry into the objectivity. Inquiry into the objectivity without imposing anything as one's views. Just inquiry into the objectivity. What, what really constitutes the objective reality. So this is so important. And I would say that uh, whether it's the Theravada tradition or Chinese tradition, Tibetan, the Tibetan Buddhism, all three, um, I would say if really wants to uh, survive in this world, the best way by which, the best premise on the basis of which we can survive is the Buddha's, stand, the Buddha's code, which I said yesterday, uh, we said, Again, to reiterate it here, um, the big shoes and the wise men and women, just as the gold smith tests the purity of the gold by cutting, rubbing, rubbing burning the gold. You should also examine my words and put them into practice, not simply because you respect me. Okay, so with this, ontologically speaking, what happened was that the physics, okay, modern science, let's say modern science, they went on to, ex to explore who we are, 
Then they first discovered the biological constituencies of the person. Then they go further to discover a subtle reality, subtle object reality, which constitutes the chemicals, molecules, chemical, the, the chemicals in the form of the molecular compositions and so forth. And then they'll go further to explore what really is there as the building blocks of the universe. They found the physics, the atoms, electrons, protons, and so forth. So this is where we are at the moment on the level of quarks, bosons, and so forth. So what has been happening was that till um, Newtonian physics, till Newtonian physics, um, things were all believed to be existing so objectively out there, objectively out there. And then at the advent of Albert Einstein, at the advent of Niels Bohr, then a new science came into being. They, in fact, there was a paradigm shift from the classical Newtonian physics to the, uh, the modern physics, which is predominantly now quantum physics and relativity theory. So now in the domain of these two of the physics, relativity and quantum theory, what is being discovered, what is being seen, what is being observed, the pertaining to the objectivity of the phenomena was that independent of the observer, the observed makes no sense. Independent of the observer, observed makes no sense. So this is the physics, the language. Whereas in the Buddhist context, independent of the designating mind, uh, nothing exists as objectively. So this is the Buddhist the terminology. So we see that uh, there is a parallel. In fact, when it comes to your insight, getting, getting the, the insight into these two concepts, then it should go beyond language. So beyond language, where even though you may, not be, you, may, you may not be speaking Sanskrit or Tibetan, but still you should be able to understand what, const, what emptiness is. And even though you may not be the, knowing English or Latin or, or Greek, but you should be understanding what quantum physics is. So from that point of view, pertaining to the concept, which is the content of the language, we see that there, there's a great possibility to see the parallels between the two streams about the quantum physics of the quantum physics. OK, a little more detailed explanations we will go later on. So as now, as a preview of quantum physics, speaking about how the objectivity makes no sense, observed observe makes no sense, independent of the observer. So there, this concept. And then in Buddhist context, that nothing exists independent of the mental designation. So when you, when you bring these two to our the insight, not on the language, not on language. If you bring it to the, translate it into the content, then we see that um, there could be a great possibility for the, the two uh, converging. And to what extent they converge? Again, it's not just simple to say that, oh, in Buddhism, say where the Aranigarjuna said, whatever is dependent and originated is empty. That means mentally designated, this is a middle way. So this is, um, just by citing modern stanza, this does not really reflect the true content of the, the, uh, the, of the language. So instead, uh, to really appreciate the nuances of Albert Einstein, no, sorry. For me, Albert Einstein and Nagarjuna, these are almost the same. OK, sorry. So the, say, to really appreciate the nuances of our Nagarjuna's philosophy, so simply by, by picking up one stanza from Aranigarjuna's the text, we, we are not at all doing any justice to this. For this, we have to understand the four philosophical schools of Buddhism, by Bhashika, Sautantra, Chittamatra, and Madhimika. In fact, there are some very prominent philosophers who believe that Aranigarjuna's philosophy and Chittamatra's philosophy, these two are the same. This is, where, this is where we talk about the need to understand the nuances, the intricacies of Aranigarjuna's philosophy. Only if you understand the other, the other philosophical schools, 
Uh, so by Bashke is relatively easy. Then South Tantra is very complicated. And the even more complicated is Chitta Mata philosophy. Only when you understand these two things and then still see the Aranagarjan's philosophy uh, supersedes, is not to undermine other traditions, but then you see the nuances, see the nuances of Aranagarjan's philosophy on the basis of understanding the other the philosophies as presented by the other schools, then you will see that this is, in fact, the beauty of the philosophy. Okay, so with this mind, to make it very quick, um, and let us go to the next, which says, Heart Sutra. In Heart Sutra, I would say that, in fact, I've been reading through the, the canonical text, the Pali, canon, Pali canonical text, and also the commentaries, the by um, Buddha Gosha and so forth. Um, so, in fact, uh, what we really need to do is to be able to be able to see the to be able to appreciate the depth of the philosophy as presented as the, that you find in the various traditions. For example, in Heart Sutra, we speak about the form is empty, emptiness of form. Form is also not different from emptiness. Emptiness is not different from the the form. So this concept. Um, this is likewise what quantum physics presents. Quantum physics, independent of our designating mind, independent of the observer, observed is empty. So what you see as empty, the empty observed, empty observed, with respect to the observer, that is, is not empty, is there, is the form is there. So this is exactly what, how you can articulate it in the context of the physics, the particular kind of physics. Now the question is, the question is, um, the seeing all these things as intellectual exercises or intellectual wonders, the question is, what is the benefit after all? What is the benefit of seeing the, going to the depth of these philosophies and all these, the, the, the science? the increase or deriva derivation. So what's the, the, the purpose? Okay, so the end, um, I would say that, of course, in Buddhism, the purpose is very clearly delineated, very clearly de delineated. Finally, O me dharma hetu prabhava hetum desham tathagato hyavatat desham jayu nirut evam vadi mashramana soha. So what it says here is a purpose but finally, what we dislike, why we have to embrace science, why we have to embrace Buddhism, why we have to embrace Hinduism, why we have to embrace Islam, Christianity, and so forth, or why we have to embrace as a human being, why we have to embrace as someone to feed on food and so forth, is because I, with these things, my happiness will be increased, my miseries will come to an end. So this is expectation. So because of this is expectation, this is what we seek. So the purpose of all these learnings, like the philosophical the derivati the derivations and the, the scientific derivations, eventually, if there is some relevance to fulfilling this basic aspiration, that is that is what is needed. So in this context, um, from the, the Buddhist con the point of view, whether Theravada, Chinese, Tibetan Buddhism, so we speak about finally to bring, to bring about the final cleansing of our own mind and to achieve the maximum happiness for yourself. In other words, the Nirvana or Buddhahood. One. Then, uh, say in Daniel's presentation, someone who puts effort to become Shravaka will become Shravaka. Someone who puts effort to become Pradig Buddha will become Pradig Buddha. Someone who puts effort to become Buddha will become Buddha. So there, except for the, the variations in the quality in what you see here, so basic idea is to free oneself from the miseries, the pains of life. And then eventually, with the third category, Buddhahood, to free not only yourself, but all others from the miseries. So with that in mind, what science has to say, what science has to say here, uh, particularly I would say not really science per se, I would say Albert Einstein, what he has to say is the whole purpose of a life, whole purpose of life should not be just for intellectual exercises. 
So what it says here, I like to read it very quickly. The first picture you know this with the incredible great enlightened being, Ravindra Nath Tagore, a Nobel laureate, and Einstein, Nobel laureate in physics. So there, the other picture is the Einstein, Albert Einstein giving the presentation, giving his the Nobel the speech. Okay. So first, before we read this, I'd like to give the summary. Otherwise, it may be too lengthy, the, the, the reading. The summary is that what he said is the miseries which we dislike, they all finally arise from creating a split in your mind, creating a split in the mind that I and you. And then on, this, on the basis of this split, then we have a sense of the tendency to feel attached to one's own inner circle, very small inner circle, and then push aside the rest of the world. So with this, we see that wherever you go in the world, your inner circle and outside, outside is much vast, much more vast. Inner circle is so small. So where you find happiness is the inner circle, which is so small. And you, where you find unhappiness, the outside world is so huge. So you're predominantly oppressed under the pains. Because predominantly you have to go outside the world. So this is the pain. So it's, this is all because of the unnecessary split that we make in a mind between I and you. So he said that, now how to, how to get rid of this problem? He said that it has to be done by, by eliminating this fabricated, this unnecessary the fabrication of the split. So how should we do? We, and we try to increase the circle of our love and affection try to increase it so that the split eventually dissolves. So if you read this, it says, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself or herself, his own thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion. So he called it as an optical delusion. And in Buddhism, it is known as a self-grasping ignorance, self-centered attitude, self-referential ego. So optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and affection for our a few persons nearest to us. Our task must, what is the remedy? Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Okay, so this is so important. Um, so with this, when we study physics, when we study science, when we study Theravada, say Chinese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, the, this is what we need to keep in mind. Keep in mind, not to forget what we want we want happiness. We, want, we don't want miseries. With that in mind, if we embrace any kind of studies and so forth, there will be any kind of inquiry, I should say, that will be of extreme benefit. Okay, so this part I already shared with you earlier. Okay, now I don't want to uh, go too much into detail with this. So here, the, the one which I'm, the, 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 the top is Niels Bohr, Niels Bohr, the, the one who's been credited mostly for his, in the, on the quantum physics, his contribution in the field of quantum physics, and the, the lower, again, the Niels Bohr to the, the left side, and the third one is Albert Einstein, um, who's mainly credited for the relativity theorem. Okay, so um, I don't want to go into too detail how much time I have. Four minutes. Okay, so he's so kind not to ring the bell. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the, what exactly is this experience? What exactly is this experience of the ultimate reality as presented by the Buddha? As presented by the Buddha, idea is, idea is when you study the, say, anatta, in the context of the Theravada, or Shunyata Anatman in the context of the Mahayana. Um, this should be what is happening to us. This experience with the, which the Buddha shared is what, we should be, what should be happening to us. It says, profound, this experience of the Anatta. How many minutes now? Three. Two minutes? Three. 
three minutes. Okay. So that experience is very profound. One, very profound, profound to the extent that you experience it, and in fact, one should be able to get a feeling that everything is like illusion. It is like illusion. That confidence one should have. One is so profound, which really is like, um, which really is like a revolutionary, revolutionary in our thought. What we believe is totally revolutionized, and what we see, what we experience, is totally in opposition to how, contrary to how things normally appear to our mind. One, number two, peaceful, and that experience. Subjectively, the experience that you get is that it's so peaceful, all the agitations, irritations, unease, the mental stress, tension, and so forth, they should dissolve. The experience is when the mental turbulence stops. And why should it stop when you experience that? This is a very different uh, thing for us to explore. The next one is the freedom of elaborations. How we see things is very different. How we see, we see things are so elaborate, so elaborative. In actuality, it's very different. And clear light, the experience is so beautiful. It's clear light and more detailed thing. Then non-composite, such a nectar-like reality is what I found, finding no one who can fathom this path in silence every time to do it. So this is the kind of experience that we should get, whether you follow Theravada or the Mahana or whatever, pertaining to the concept of Anatta or Shunyata. Okay, so now there are several things. I may quickly go through, just, I will not go into uh, the explanations. Same, quantum physics, one thing quantum physics is that Newsport said that you study quantum physics, and if, if you're not shocked by it, you have not understood quantum physics. Likewise, if you did not get that experience of the, the, the bliss, the peace, and the amusement when you study anatta or the shunyata, you have not understood shunyata or anatta. Okay, so dependent origination, uh, the other side of dependent origination, which Ajiri is so beautifully explained, um, I can't replace that. He did it so well. Okay, so this is macro world and the macro world, the two thirds, about two thirds. Okay, I will just do this and we'll stop here, I promise. Okay, so this is a very important thing. In quantum physics, there's what is known as, uh, known as quantum vacuum. There's one concept of quantum vacuum. So it says that the that the universe, the universe that we have now, uh, came from the Big Bang. So there's a Big Bang theory. So whether it's a single Big Bang, multiple Big Bang, these are all still on the questionable. Uh, nothing can be decided as of yet. So the Big Bang. So Big Bang at the time of the initial the initial phase of the Big Bang, what really existed in the universe was the quantum vacuum, according to quantum physics. So now, in the parlance of Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, Aranigarajan's philosophy, and very likely, very likely, if you if you if you uh, go to study the anatta concept, so there also, so finally, the fabric of the entire universe is the emptiness, ultimate reality, anatta, or the emptiness. So. From the quantum physics point of view is the quantum vacuum. So vacuum has a connotation of emptiness, and emptiness has a connotation of vacuum. So these are very similar. From this quantum vacuum, if you see to the extreme extreme left, the white part, that represents the quantum vacuum. So from white, from the white left to the right, when you go there, we are going in time. We are flowing time. So from this vacuum, total vacuum, then whole the universe came into existence, and from the, the various galaxies, then the world systems, the solar systems, all these things originate in time. So likewise, from the fabric of emptiness or ultimate reality, then all phenomena, the, fun the, the phenomenal world, they came into existence from this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Geshala. It was uh, wonderful. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite the last speaker. Uh, in fact, uh, in the morning, 
we have been told that uh, in fact sisters should be first then brothers but uh, somehow but but i <laughs> but now she she happens to be the last speaker but but believe in buddha i mean uh, this is just a this is just pradnyapti right i mean you are you are last because the others spoke before you i mean otherwise you are really not last so please <laughs> start your presentation Venerable members of the Sangha, Geshe Deorji Damdula, thank you very much for having me here. It's a challenge to speak after him, though, Pradyapni uh, or not, <laughs> because he was uh, talking about quantum physics and uh, things which are a little difficult for me, at least, to bend my mind around. I normally do not make a presentation, so you'll forgive the basic uh, quality of uh, what is up there on the screen. I prefer to speak uh, directly uh, to the listeners, but uh, considering that uh, the time is short and I may forget something, and also bearing in mind that um, my talk comes after a series of uh, very intelligent and thought-provoking presentations, um, I may not have your full and complete attention. You might be tired, so I thought I'd just put up some points up there, otherwise I would really prefer if my audience uh, looks at me. It's a little difficult to speak to people who are looking there. Um, having said that, I'm very grateful to Geshe Dorji Damdula for suggesting that I talk on this text. Um, this whole Theravada Mahayana thing from yesterday, we've been talking about it and um, quite honestly, uh, when Geshe Dorje Damdula said that there are three traditions that uh, continue out of the 18, which is the Theravada and the Dharma Guptaka and the Mula Sarvastivada, he's of course talking of the Vinayas which are being followed and therein lies uh, the clue to the whole situation. And uh, quite self-explanatory according to me, uh, in the sense that Mahayana was not really a 19th school, added on to the 18th, but if the monks were being ordained in the existing traditions, then we have, we have a clue um, that it was from within these traditions, from within these groups that the, a sort of, um, not very self-conscious perhaps, but a movement does start towards uh, exploring um, the you know, uh, possibly the outer reaches of what Buddha had uh, taught and explained. And um, there is a whole body of literature which scholars have been working on for some time now. And um, I would just like to, at this moment, uh, recall um, Professor Louis de la Vallée Poussin because he did some remarkable work long ago, actually. And uh, he made this distinction between sects and schools. And uh, the sects, he said, were, you know, those who uh, were divided along lines of the Vinaya, whereas he used the term schools more for, uh, to reflect the, the term vada uh, that we use in uh, Sanskrit. And um, so taking on from there, uh, this text, which I'm going to talk about a little briefly today, is called the Shalistamba Sutra in uh, Sanskrit. Uh, it doesn't really exist anymore in Sanskrit. Uh, it, ex it is found in Chinese translations and uh, Tibetan translations. It is considered a Mahayana Sutra. And uh, uh, despite it not, the original not being available to us in Sanskrit, it is so extensively quoted in other Sanskrit texts that by taking reference to the Chinese and Tibetan versions, about almost 90% of the original can be uh, reconstructed, and it has uh, been so reconstructed. So just to give you an idea, though, since uh, you know, there are a number of followers of um, Tibetan uh, masters here um, and the Tibetan tradition, the, uh, some of the texts in which we find this sutra 
uh, copiously quoted is the Shiksha Samuchaya of Shantideva. We have it in the Panjika, the commentary to the Bodhicharya Avatara. And we also have uh, quotations in um, Chandakirti's Prasannapada. Uh, these are the four Chinese uh, translations. They are numbered Taisho 709 to uh, 712. 12, out of which the dating of uh, Taisho 709 is the perhaps the more uh, reliable one, and it places this translation in the time of the Eastern Jin Dynasty, which is the 4th century CE. There is an older version of this text which is available to us in uh, the Chinese uh, materials, which is Taisho 708. Uh, this has a different structure a different order compared to the order in the Tibetan translation. It also has some materials which are not found in the uh, Sanskrit and Tibetan materials. This text was translated by the grandson of the very famous Anshigao. Anshigao was, uh, is credited with making the first translation of the Anapanasati Sutra. And this version uh, is perhaps as early as the first half of the third century. Typically, when we find uh, Chinese translations, we tend to place the base text, the root text, maybe a century earlier. So we could look at the dating of this text as the first century, sorry, second century. Um, uh, for those of us here who are uh, followers uh, and students of the Tibetan tradition, there are manuscript fragments which have been found of this text which represent perhaps the oldest, um, very ancient at least, extant example of the Tibetan language. Um, the Tibetan translations are available uh, in the Kanjur and they don't really differ too much um, from each other. There are also uh, maintained in the Tibetan collections three uh, commentaries which are ascribed to Nagarjuna. Um, there, there was a speaker in the morning who was talking about how there is a large number of texts in the Tibetan canon ascribed to um, Arinagarjuna, and we don't know whether they all are his or uh, you know can be legitimately so ascribed to him. However, if we do accept that uh, these commentaries are indeed uh, composed by Nagarjuna, then that pushes the date of the text um, even earlier. Uh, the interesting part of this text, as I mentioned, uh, it is considered a Mahayana text. However, it has several passages which have uh, very close parallels to the Pali suttas, two notable among them being the Mahatanha Sankhaya Sutta and the Maha Rahulova the Sutta. I will not be dwelling too much on the correspondences here in my uh, paper. I will uh, later on talk about the uh, 12 links of the dependent origination and the variances within the, uh, how this is described in the Pali tradition and the, uh, this text itself. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, there are um, several uh, parallels uh, with, this, with the Pali canonical materials. And the Mahayana aspect, the notable Mahayana uh, aspect here is that the explication is by uh, Bodhisattva Maitreya to Shariputra. Uh, although the older Chinese uh, text that I've uh, mentioned, Taisho 708, doesn't feature Maitreya, it is just Shariputra who explains the 12 links of dependent origination. The concluding uh, passages of this text also have a very distinctive Mahayana flavor in the sense that Maitreya says in, this, uh, in the last verses that those who comprehend dependent origination fully and completely for such persons, for such aspirants, the Buddha has predicted that they would attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. And uh, this is very clearly a Mahayana uh, statement. Uh, one final comment here about the difficulties of dating such uh, materials. Uh, those of us who study early Mahayana literature, we place the Pradnya uh, 
uh, texts and the lotus uh, in the first century BCE. And this text does not exhibit any of the, uh, in, the in these two texts particularly, the Pradnaparamita and the um, lotus, there are several ideas, Mayanist ideas, which have been consolidated, so to say, or they have been firmed up. Whereas our text, the Shalistamba Sutra, doesn't reflect any of these uh, developments. This has led some scholars to say that this perhaps is an even older text going back maybe uh, as early as of 3rd century C BCE. But there is a problematic in this kind of discourse really because it presumes that uh, Mahayana developments, uh, this kind of a text would not, Mahayana developments would just, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for, would just sort of take over every sort of development and that these in-between phases would not have a legitimate standing on their own. And there is a problematic, uh, strictly speaking, in this kind of a view. And um, so I have some disagreement with um, pushing this text to that far back in Buddhist history. Coming to the text itself, um, we know the 12-fold, all of us know the 12 links of dependent origination, so I'm not going to go into those details here. But uh, in the Pali Canon, we find um, there are several uh, suttas where the 12 links are not always fully explained. Uh, they are partially explained, and there are some where the 12 links are. However, the, uh, it's very clear in the Pali text that it is a sort of a psychological uh, process, uh, avijja pachaya sankhara, sankhara pachaya vinyana, and uh, you know it proceeds uh, like that. In the Rice Seedling Sutra, we have a dependent origination explained in a twofold way initially. There is a subjective experience, just like there is in the Pali. There is also an objective uh, phenomenon which is described using the example of a seed which sprouts the seed watered. Uh, sprouts and gives rise to a stalk and then the leaf and then the, you know, a whole big tree and fruit and flower and the rest of it. <clears throat> this twofold formula is then further explained with the clear distinction between Hetu and Pratyaya. This we do not find in the Sutta materials, at least in the Pali, explaining very distinctly the two categories of Hetu and Pratyaya. And what is also remarkable is in this particular case, all the Pratyayas are identified with the six Dhatus. By six over here, along with the four Mahabhutas, we have space and we have consciousness. Yeah? In the case of uh, the example where we use the uh, uh, seed which is sprouting, the Tibetan translation replaces consciousness with ritu, with season. However, from the point of view of the Pali, this is a mistake because ritu is not a dhatu. And uh, even more interestingly, the Sanskrit texts which have quotations on this aspect either leave out Ritu or they don't use the term Dhatu at all. So the Sanskrit texts are more in line with what the Pali uh, would have formulated either in terms of Dhatu or in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Pratyas. Whereas in the Tibetan we find Ritu is distinctly mentioned. Coming to the 12 uh, links itself, uh, here we have some really, really elegant uh, explanation, which uh, as we go along, you will notice that there is a, a slant towards uh, the whole act of perception in the human mind. Um, so ignorance, typically in the Pali texts, ignorance is ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, typically. And I'm open to anyone correcting me. I think otherwise there is also the uh, lack ignorance of arising and uh, passing away of the six ayatanas, but I could be wrong. Uh, but to my mind, notably it is the ignorance of four noble truths. Ignorance here is explained as under understanding the six factors, the six tattoos, mistaking them to uh, uh, represent some sort of a permanent, eternal, pleasant self. 
As a result of this mistaken understanding, greed, hatred, and delusion develop in relation to the six sense spheres, to the six ayatanas, and these are then called mental uh, formations. Whereas sankharas typically are either conceptualization uh, or are explained as uh, the three types of kama of body, speech, and mind. Here we have greed, hatred, and delusion developing as a result of this mistaken perception of a self. And then you have this mental formation. As a result of this, there is discrete appearance of objects, and this is consciousness. This is the arising of uh, consciousness. As far as name and form is also concerned, um, Nama in the Pali texts will typically refer to Vedana, Sanya, Chetana, Phasa, and Manasikara. And whereas here we have, uh, the text states that all the um, non-material aggregates uh, of the Upadana Skandhas, they are all together along with consciousness, Nama, and the four Mahab great Mahabhutas are, uh, and the derived matter is form. The six sense faculties are the six entrances. This is, uh, this, there cannot be much uh, difference in that. And when these three come together, that brings about contact. When Nama, Rupa, and the six sense faculties, when they all come together, that brings about contact. What is really beautiful is the next one. The experience of contact is sensation. And this is keeping and continuity. In the Pali, we tend to find breaks. When Vedana is described, it doesn't really connect us up so much with contact. We find the texts will tell us that there is three kinds of feeling. There is pleasant, unpleasant, and there is neutral. Whereas here, you have, you, it keeps a sort of continuity with the uh, earlier um, uh, cause, and it says experience of contact is sensation, and clinging to that sensation is desire. Yeah, whereas desire we uh, explain in the Pali as bhavatanha, vibhavatanha, and uh, one more, uh, kamatanha. Sorry, I have them always in the wrong order, uh, but <laughs> sorry about that. But um, yeah, so the and so clinging to sensation is desire. And the expansion of desire is grasping. Action born out of grasping. How much time do I have? Okay, so I need to just uh, go quickly. Action born out of grasping and giving rise to rebirth is becoming. Manifestation of aggregates as a result of becoming is birth. The maturation of these aggregates is decay and the perishing of, the, uh, of these is death. And the internal burning of the deluded being is grief and lamentation and uh, all the rest of it. I don't want to go into that. Um, so we have uh, very clearly a different explanation of those very same 12 links at an early point in Buddhist history, very interesting times. Apart from uh, the uh, 12 links themselves, there are four limbs they describe, which develop through causality for, to perform the action of assembling, assembling, of course, of the human personality. And here, consciousness is described as the seed, as the cause, which is planted in the field of karma. It is watered by desire, and it is dispersed here and there by ignorance. And here and there, in the entrances of arising, this causes the birth of name and form. And this is not self-made, not made by another. We know these categories of arguments, and yet not arisen without cause. I'd quickly like to take you through two beautiful uh, descriptions in this text, which uh, scholars uh, tend to uh, say this, oh, oh, this is definitely Mahayana, because the m you know, mirror is used as a metaphor, uh, to explain that nothing really transmigrates. There are two examples which are used. One is the reflection of the face in the mirror, 
where the text says there is only the appearance of the fruit of karma because of the non-deficiency of causes and conditions. Similarly, it uses the example of the moon disk. And it says the moon which wanders 4,000 leagues above, and yet again the moon's reflection is seen in a small pool of water. I don't know how many uh, people here have heard of uh, Dogen, um, the 13th century um, Japanese um, um, Soto Zen uh, founder. One of his most beautiful poetic descriptions of enlightenment is precisely using um, this uh, metaphor where he says um, that um, enlightenment is like the moon reflected on water. It doesn't um, break the water, neither is the moon uh, wet. And um, so I would just like to um, conclude very quickly because my friend, before he rings the second bell and makes me very nervous, um, I just want to say that uh, this text is representative of materials which are in that in-between period which reflect a sort of organic, not very self-conscious movement within Buddhist schools that Buddhist schools, Buddhists themselves were from day one fairly argumentative. We only have to read the uh, Kathavatthu to know that by the time of Ashoka, we had such a diversity of opinions and uh, uh, views, uh, and that this obviously this was not going to stop because Mughali Puttatissa said we are Vibhajavada and the others are all wrong. Of course, it continued, and we should not really look upon these categories of Theravada and Mahayana or anything else for that matter as being ideas that developed in independent silos with maybe. 40 feet thick um, radioactivity proof walls kind of thing. Everybody was in very, very uh, uh, direct communication with each other. Uh, to all of us who are here who are uh, Mahayanists, we must know that Asanga Vasubandhu and Nagarjuna himself would have taken their um, Vinaya vows in one of these 18 schools. There was no Mahayanist uh, uh, ordination, uh, like I said, until the Chinese started taking bodhisattva precepts uh, sometime uh, later in Buddhist history. It was extremely important for your ordination lineage to go all the way back uh, to the Buddha. So yes, these categories are artificial, and these materials are extremely interesting because they represent uh, the kind of ideas that Buddhists were grappling with, that they were exploring, which take uh, you know, full and final forms in the works of uh, great masters later on. Thank you very much. So um, thank you very much. Uh, and you see, so uh, she, Supriyaji had the last word, and we started with the uh, Shali Stamba, I mean, actually started with Spruti and ended with the Shali Stamba. Uh, two very interesting uh, uh, sutras in the, which, which uh, in a way connect the two traditions of Staviravada and the Mahayana. So uh, I once again thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to, to listen to this talk sitting here uh, across the table. And uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers for the wonderful um, presentations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>